Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to welcome you to our second session of the WSU OSU Tree Fruit Extension webinar series. I'm Ashley Thompson. I'll be one of your hosts. I'm with Oregon State University Extension. Our other hosts today are Matthew Whiting of, of WSU Horticulture and Bernardita Salato of WSU Extension. Today's uh, conversation is going to be with Dr. Manoj Karki of WSU, and he's going to be talking about artificial intelligence, cyber physical systems, and robotics for agriculture. Okay, welcome everybody to this seminar. Again, I'm Manoj Karki uh, from Washington State University. Um, thank you very much, Ashley and Bernadita and Matthew, uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to present uh, some of the work we do at Washington State University in agricultural automation and robotics. Um, as Ashley mentioned, uh, I'll talk uh, briefly about the, the historical development in this area, um, present some of the, the latest research and development activities that are occurring at, at my lab uh, in collaboration with a lot of uh, uh, fantastic collaborators, uh, including, um, including Matt and, and Ashley who are here in the panel. And then towards the end, uh, if we get time, I'll uh, try to introduce some of my insights and some of my thoughts in terms of where we might be going in the future uh, in this particular area. So <clears throat> this is a blank slide by design here. Um, and um, I would like to start with these two pictures and would like to give the audience uh, about five to 10 seconds to, to kind of look at those and and kind of visualize what's going on. So with that, um, we'll be talking about uh, mostly how uh, artificial intelligence and cyber physical system enabled uh, technologies, including robotics, uh, have been playing roles in, in agriculture and are going to play a role in agriculture uh, special, with a special focus uh, in uh, fruit and vegetable crop production, which is uh, of great importance here in, in the Pacific Northwest, including Washington and Oregon. Um, uh, quick, uh, quick historical background here. Agricultural mechanization was recognized as one of the most important engineering achievements of 20th century. Uh, I think it was number seven out of 100 uh, technological achievements uh, that were recognized. It was recognized for a reason because the advancements in mechanization in agriculture have played a critical role in increase uh, quality, quantity and quanti quality of uh, agricultural products while reducing the, um, the amount of labor and amount of farming uh, population involved in agriculture. Um, for that matter, out, um, in, in last 100, 120 years, I think uh, in US, the population involved in farming has gone down from about 90% or more to less than 2% now. And, and, and agricultural mechanization has, uh, has been the instrumental factor in, in doing so. That's why it was recognized as, as a big achievement. Um, some of the example uh, technologies that uh, made it happen include tillage machines like these, um, these, as we can see in this picture, uh, big planters like these, um, and tractors pulling those uh, planters, uh, different kinds of chemical application systems, such as these boom sprayers for annual crops, uh, row crops. Um, harvesters like a uh, row crop harvester like these um, including uh, corn har uh, combined harvesters for corn and soybean and wheat uh, sugarcane harvesters like these uh, we have also seen uh, um, very widespread adoption of guidance and auto steering technologies that have been used in planting and harvesting and many other field operations including uh, for example, chemical applications and different kinds of crops. Uh, in recent years, there has been also some a level of commercial adoption of uh, robotic or automated systems for crop thinning and weeding, uh, to, to give you an example. However, most of these technologies uh, and automated or mechanized technologies that we have implemented or adopted in farming 
have benefited mostly annual row crops uh, such as corn, soybean, and wheat. Um, in the um, specialty crop area, um, particularly for fresh market uh, fruit crops and vegetable crops, we are still facing a lot of challenges. Uh, to give you a perspective on, on what does that mean, let's look at these two pictures that I, um, that I started this presentation with. One on our left was uh, captured uh, some 80 years ago um, versus the other one on our right uh, captured just a few years ago. And other than the color that we see in those pictures, I think the way apples harvested some hundred years ago versus now would not be any different. Or as we can see, they're climbing up and down the ladders with a, with a big bag that they used to carry 30, 40 pounds of fruit up and down the ladders. Um, this is very highly physical uh, work. Uh, it has uh, health issues, I mean, uh, safety, health and safety issues associated with it. A lot of ladder falls and, and repetitive motion kind of injuries. So this has both the laborious aspect of it as well as the labor safety aspect of it. And um, um, I believe with all the advancement in technologies, including artificial intelligence, um, I think we do uh, deserve better than this. Certainly labor availability and labor cost and our other important factors uh, that has led us to work um, our focus, our work heavily in, in this area as well. So there has been long research and development as we, um, a lot of us know in this area over the last several decades, uh, but uh, not much commercial success yet. Um, I'll talk about recent advancements certainly and potential for commercial success um, in, re in recent future uh, potentially, but so far, um, there hasn't been any uh, remarkable commercial success uh, in automating or, robotic, uh, or using robotic technologies in uh, fruit and vegetable crops, uh, including harvesting. Uh, some of the limitations in, uh, in uh, ad adopting robotic technologies for tree fruit crops and other fresh market uh, vegetable and fruit crops include the speed, accuracy, and robustness. Or, or their lack of those uh, features. And in some cases, produce or plant damages these technologies might cause. And certainly there is this aspect of cost, lack of adopt, adoption. Um, a lot of these high-tech uh, uh, technologies have, um, have uh, relatively higher cost of adoption in the beginning because they're costly, uh, um, there is not, a widespread adoption and then that uh, creates an environment where um, achieving an efficient uh, production um, uh, remains uh, uh, limited or challenging because of lack of um, what we call uh, economy of scale. So there is this cycle that we need to break uh, in uh, around this cost and lack of adoption issue. To address some of the challenges that have been the bottlenecks of, uh, uh, for adopting these technologies, Washington State University, particularly in my research program, we've been focusing on developing various uh, component technologies and integrated systems for um, automation and robotics in, in a few of these operations, particularly focusing on uh, tree fruit harvesting. As we can see in this slide, um, we are working on both apple and cherry harvesting technologies for, um, for um, apples and cherries. Uh, I have been spending a lot of time in this particular area. Um, I am uh, privileged to have uh, Matt Whiting, uh, Dr. Matt Whiting as one of the uh, lead researchers and our collaborators in, in um, the, the horticultural side of these projects. Um, one of the early efforts in harvesting cherries was actually led by, led by Dr. Whiting um, some eight, nine years ago, maybe a decade ago now. And then I've been continuing uh, with his collaboration to, to improve these technologies as well as aid 
uh, automation and robotic aspects into it. Um, in addition to uh, those uh, second cast type of harvesting technologies that uh, Matt laid initially, and I'm continuing with that, we are also working on uh, robotic technologies um, to, do the, to do the similar operation. I'll talk about why both kinds of technologies are um, in, of my interest and, I, and why, why I believe it is important to work in those, um, both of those areas in a little bit. But let's talk about automated cherry harvesting for a second. Um, we started with this big machine that was developed by a USDA scientist out of West Virginia um, over the last uh, two, three decades actually, starting uh, early 90s. And the, the effort then was to use a big uh, impact type um, um, harvester that would, um, that would sick entire trees and the, the cherries would fall or, or apples or whatever uh, fruit is being harvested would fall all the way onto uh, almost the ground level and would be, uh, would be collected in this kind of inclined mirrored harvest, um, harvesters. Uh, mirrored meaning there would be one copy in one side of the row and another would be in the other side of the row. Um, with, uh, with our effort, we improved a lot of mechanisms to collect this fruit, uh, but also we improved the mechanism to sick the, the branches more gently with uh, different kinds of sicking patterns. Um, and that, would, uh, that has shown to be uh, more effective in, in releasing this fruit and, and limiting the damage. Um, not presented here, but we have also tested a lot of different kinds of designs for handheld uh, second cast harvesting that would be used by workers um, and that would be um, useful in certain um, more traditional architectures to, to improve the harvesting efficiency of these workers by sometimes even 10 folds as, as our research so. And the latest efforts, we have also used machine vision system, a camera system to acquire images in both daytime and nighttime and apply image processing techniques to find out where these branches are. And then we're adding this capability into these machines so that uh, we could automatically send the sacking mechanisms to uh, locate and grab these branches and sack, sack them automatically. So this is some of the newer efforts that we're uh, putting in place. Robotic harvesting has been another big area uh, in my research program. Um, as we can see in this video, uh, over the last six, seven years, um, we have developed a robotic manipulator and a robotic hand, a single hand, single manipulator combination here that uses the camera system to find out where the apples are and the robotic machine would go grab those apples in certain optimized way based on our uh, evaluation of how these fruits are uh, picked by manual labor. And we have demonstrated the capability of using robotic hands in picking this fruit. Um, and then in recent years, over the last uh, almost three years, we have, we have been collaborating with a company out of Israel uh, called FF Robotics. And as you can see on the right, there is a fully scale machine developed in, through this collaboration. This machine was tested in Washington and Israel over the last two years, and it's showing a lot of promise for, uh, for potential commercialization in the near future. Um, anyway, uh, this has been a big area of, uh, of research and development in my lab. Um, through our experiments in the field over the last two years, we have identified a few issues that we are uh, currently working at to improve this machine and we'll be doing another round of field evaluation in Washington Orchards uh, later this year. Uh, some of the, the capabilities that we're trying to aid includes um, detection and localization of uh, trellis wires, uh, some of the smaller branches, um, as well as uh, finding the orientation of the fruit so that the robotic hand would be uh, sent to those uh, fruit from a safe direction, uh, avoiding uh, collision with trellis wires and other obstructions uh, so that, again, we would be able to more efficient in picking this fruit. 
We have also been trying to uh, improve the design of the robotic hand so that uh, picking these fruits becomes a little bit more efficient in terms of uh, not picking as many um, twigs along with these fruit, uh, which has been a, a limiting factor uh, in our previous uh, experiment. This uh, th previous slide I mentioned about uh, image processing capabilities that we're trying to aid. This slide just uh, demonstrates those capabilities. As you can see in these uh, pictures, um, our latest effort now can identify these uh, apples and the obstructions around them, as well as the orientation of these apples so such that the robotic hand might access these or approach these apples from a safe direction. On the lower right corner, we also see that the trellis wire has been uh, very accurately detected and located, localized using this sensing system, which allows us to avoid these wires while sending these robotic hands uh, to, to grab and pick these apples. Um, otherwise, we would be hitting these, these uh, wires uh, frequently um, and damaging either the, the robotic hand or sometimes maybe even these, these uh, trailer systems themselves. Another effort in our lab is uh, around what we call targeted second catch harvesting. As I mentioned earlier, there are some varieties, some architectures, some situations where robotic picking uh, makes a lot of sense, but I believe there are other situations, other varieties, other architectures where uh, second catch harvesting might give a feasible alternative solution. And in some cases, again, maybe this might make more sense. Uh, for example, for some of the commodity varieties or, uh, or low, um, low end varieties uh, that may have to be, uh, or the robotic uh, picking may not be commercially feasible, this technology might provide an alternative. We have been, um, be, we have been developing uh, what we call targeted multi-layer second cat system in this particular effort where we would have a seeker that would apply very small amount of energy to target a small section of the branches so that this fruit would be shaken off very gently and would be caught right underneath where they are so that we can minimize the energy with which these fruits are released and we would minimize the distance this fruit would travel. Uh, and this is through our field experiments as you can see in this next slide, we have seen that we can limit fruit damage to 10% and be able to harvest most of the food in some varieties. So as we can see, when we are using only two or three layers at this time um, to prove the concept, but we could have as many as seven or eight layers or as many layers there are in some of these, um, these uh, trend architectures. And we, uh, again, the research has shown that we could achieve almost 98, 95% fruit removal and catching efficiency um, for some varieties while keeping the fruit quality to to uh, our fruit damage to around 10%, which has been very promising in my opinion, um, but uh, certainly the current level of damage with manual picking is slightly better than this. So we are still working on to improve it, but certainly there are other aspects of uh, the, the overall harvesting system, including labor availability, labor cost and things like that. So I believe this kind of technology could also uh, provide a viable commercial uh, solution uh, in near future for some varieties. So in addition to harvesting, we in our research program have been focusing on various different aspects of automation and robotics for fruit crops and vegetable crops. Uh, one of those areas is automated canopy and crop load management. Um, again, I have listed some of the collaborators here. 
from different universities. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, uh, Matt Whiting, Dr. Matt Whiting has been in all of my projects that I, I'm not listing, I have not listed here. Um, even Ashley uh, has been in all the projects recently. So again, I'm not repeating those here, but thank you both of you for being a very good collaborators and, and, and providing that crops uh, horticulture side of expertise to, to our research program. What I'm trying to say here also is that actually today we got a pretty good grant for developing robotic technologies for um, automated robotic pollination, which has been a big effort in Matt Whiting's lab actually over the past several years. So we are continuing to work on that and, and moving forward to more robotic approaches for pollination. So <clears throat> that would be also coming in recent future. Um, that said, we have been working really hard in developing robotic solutions for pruning and thinning. Um, for that matter, we have camera systems identifying branches uh, for pruning or flowers for thinning and locating them in this uh, natural environment. And we are developing robotic hands and manipulators or arms to get there and, and do whatever uh, needs to be done, whether it is pruning. If it is pruning, we'll be cutting some of those selected branches. If it is thinning, we might be uh, removing some of the flowers uh, in, in given clusters. And, and if it is training, would be yeah, tying this, these uh, branches onto trellis wires. All these efforts are going on in my lab and as we speak. Um, one of the examples uh, we can see here is for uh, robotic pruning. We recently did a lab experiment, as you can see in this, uh, in this video. Um, we kind of mimicked a uh, uh, UFO theory architecture in the lab with those wooden posts. And then we implemented this robotic system that can automatically create the uh, or recreate the 3D structure of the trees and can analyze these structures uh, to identify branches that needs to be pruned out. And then this robotic system can go there and cut these branches that have been selected. Uh, this system has not been to the field yet. Uh, if it were not for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we would potentially uh, be in the field over the last month or so and do some, uh, would have done some uh, experiments in the field as well. Uh, as soon as the situation becomes better, we'll be in the field, uh, particularly because two or more uh, students need to work right next to each other to be able to perform these experiments and which is not possible uh, under current guidelines for, um, for social distancing. We have also worked on developing technologies for automated red raspberry cane bundling. Um, as you can see in these pictures and this little video, uh, there is a camera system that finds where the canes are. And then the robotic system goes close to those cans and there is a mechanism that brings all the cans together. And there is another mechanism that goes around these bundled cans and applies an adhesive piece to hold them together. Over the last two or three years, we have also expanded our automation, uh, automated robotic um, work to vineyards. Uh, one of our efforts has been to identify and, and estimate the trajectory of cordons and the horizontal permanent structure of these vines, uh, both in dormant season as well as in the growing season when uh, cordons are almost completely occluded or blocked by these suits or leaves. As you can see in the fourth week of suit, suit growth in this particular slide, uh, lower right image, uh, we, we can see cordons are almost completely invisible. Even in this kind of situation, 
using the models developed during the dormant season for cord and trajectories, we can fairly accurately estimate where, where those cordons could be. And this automated detection of cord and trajectory has been used uh, currently to automate the green shirt thinning process. Um, some a lab experiment, a lab prototype has been developed and was tested in the uh, research vineyard at Washington State University uh, about two months ago. Uh, and we'll, we are continuing to advance that uh, system and uh, potentially do some field experiments uh, this year or next year in a commercial plot. Uh, we have been collaborating with Mercer Canyon uh, with this one. I would like to thank you them as well. But uh, uh, again, this is another effort going on currently. We also uh, can use this kind of uh, imaging, image processing system to potentially do dormant season uh, selective pruning uh, in vineyards and similar technologies could be used in uh, training apple trees and, and potentially other applications in the future. As you can see in this, uh, in this picture, even under uh, fairly dense foliage, we're able to estimate these uh, uh, trajectories of these uh, cordons. Um, in this particular picture, you can see and the cordons quite uh, quite clearly, but what we did here is that we took images before uh, removing any uh, vertical suits or any new suits, and then once we took images and estimated cordon trajectories, we removed a bunch of these green suits so that we could actually see where the cordons are. And then we manually plotted a trajectory along those cordons. So this is a kind of a validation effort for our algorithms if they're working well. And as we can see between green, green and red lines in this, in this particular image, uh, we see fairly good uh, matching between the automated detection of trajectories versus the manual detection. So we're doing very good job in terms of estimating cordon trajectories even under um, a very uh, heavy canopy cover. Another effort has been to develop a robotic solution for weeding and vegetable crops. Um, we have tested uh, one of our robotic system in carrots and, and onion, and we have achieved a fairly good accuracy there. Both, uh, uh, we have our effort focuses on both detection and killing of these um, weeds but also um, to stabilize this platform even when the platform is running over uneven uh, ground surfaces in these vegetable crops so that uh, again even if there are a lot of uh, uneven uh, um, tracks in the field uh, even when we are irrigating these fields and some some, some uh, areas are um, have some water or whatever other obstructions are there, this platform can still operate uh, at a very leveled and stable condition so that um, these weeding uh, results can be highly accurate. So again, our efforts has been both in stabilizing this, this platform as well as um, accurately detecting and killing these, these weeds. Um, last couple of slides about the about the research efforts. We have been using unmanned aerial systems or drones for many different applications in fruit crops and vegetable crops uh, at the Center for Precision and Automated Agricultural Systems. We call it CPAS. Uh, particularly in my research program, we try to use these as, as robots to do something in the field. So for example, in this particular case, we are using drones to automatically detect where birds, bird activities are happening and send these to the direction where the birds are either um, feeding onto the crop already or to the direction where these birds might be coming in to the or flying into the field so that we could intercept and, and deter them away. As we can see from these bar graphs, um, or this chart here, 
uh, there is a substantial reduction in the number of birds that are detected in the field per hour between when we are flying these UAVs or drones versus when we are not. And again, this has been very um, um, effective tool in my opinion to, to do so. Um, that was again demonstrated in my program over the last few years. Um, last two slides maybe about the projects. We have been also focusing heavily on, on developing handheld solutions for um, for specialty crops and particularly uh, in my program, I'm developing applications for cell phone based or mobile devices for counting and sizing uh, different kinds of fruit fruits, including apples and grapes. And uh, this one, Smart Irrigation, has been a project uh, active in my lab for the last two years, less than three, about a year and a half, I would say, or maybe two years, where we are trying to use all possible kinds of data that we can collect and put them into uh, what is called a big data analytic framework, where we'll be using artificial intelligence in interpreting the data and creating a model which we believe would be much more reliable and robust compared to using uh, one kind of data or some fragmented data um, in making these kinds of decisions. Again, this is a smart irrigation effort where we'll be using many different kinds of historical data as well as sensor data such as, um, such as soil moisture uh, probes and canopy measurement systems, uh, non-contact sensors like uh, spectral sensors, uh, cameras, and many other sensors to make the, the decision uh, for irrigation timing and volume, which I believe would be more robust. Finally, this is the, the newest uh, project that, were fun that was funded just a few months ago by Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission. Um, Ashley has been our great uh, cool uh, co-investigator in this project. Um, the effort here would be to optimize nitrogen application um, based on the needs of individual plants. We'll be looking at uh, the color information that is there in these plants, as well as um, spectral and soil sensing data and a few other uh, pieces of information, including uh, size of the trunks of these, these trees to make, again, a uh, a uh, decision that I believe would be uh, more reliable and robust in identifying needs of nitrogen needs of individual plants. The goal here is to go towards managing our orchards and vineyards and other crop fields at uh, individual plant level. Okay, um, I think we are into, um, yeah, 341 now. Uh, so there are a couple of more slides about the potential future direction that may not be as important anyway. So if there are questions, I can stop here or I can continue uh, for another 10 minutes or so and would have questions at the end. How about you can continue, Manoj, and we'll uh, take questions then. Okay, let's do that. So where are we going in automation and robotics, uh, particularly in specialty crops? We talk a lot about mechanization, those big machines that were developed in the past, they do a lot of field operations. Uh, for example, I think we do some uh, mechanized planting in the orchards. We do a lot of mechanized uh, chemical application. There are a lot of these technologies already in play. And then we have automation and robotics. Uh, increasingly automated machines are being used in orchards and vineyards and, 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 and vegetable fields and many other crops already. And we have, as we saw in my presentation, my program and a lot of other research programs in the universities and private companies and startups have been focusing on developing more automated, more robotic solutions uh, that utilize artificial intelligence, internet of things, big data analytics, these newer advancements in computer science and other disciplines into again, making these machines more robot, uh, more automated. 
or using these robotic machines to do a few, uh, a lot of field operations. At the same time, we're also being more and more capable of managing our farms more precisely. For example, I mentioned earlier, we would like to get to a uh, plant level management. Again, that's the goal here, but we still have a lot of capabilities in applying. I mean, currently, uh, we already have a lot of capabilities in managing our farms in a precise way. For example, there are chemical applicators that could alter the, the amount and location of chemical, app chemical application based on tree size or, or, or canopy volume or canopy density <clears throat> and parameters like that. But then there is this increasing capabilities that we can aid into precision management based on robotics and automation that we just mentioned. Now, all these are coming together into this, what we call smart or intelligent agriculture, where not just the hard field operations, but also the decisions we need to make every day in farming could be done by these machines or, or these machines would provide a decision support tool that would help farmers and managers do a better job in terms of, um, in terms of making those farming decisions. And this is called agriculture 4.0 or is also called smart farming in various, uh, uh, depending upon who you're talking to. In this next slide, I'd like to introduce the concept of artificial intelligence, cyber physical system and robotics and how they play a role in agriculture. Artificial intelligence is a technology that allows us to do a few things, including what we call machine learning, where a machine would learn specific operations or a specific phenomenon in the field uh, through examples. Uh, we have been perhaps hearing about deep learning a lot in, in, in uh, recent years. Deep learning is a branch of machine learning that has been very, very powerful to learn new phenomenons and create new models using uh, a large amount of example data. There are similar technologies called expert system, which uses the expertise of human being in creating a computer system that can make decisions or help make decisions. There are predictive modeling where um, we can use these models to predict what happens in the future. This art, the basic uh, technology around artificial intelligence is allowing us to develop various uh, tools such as pattern recognition, machine vision, meaning where cameras are used to understand environments. There are big data analytics where different kinds of data, images, weather data, uh, historical production data, all those things can be brought together into making decisions. Robotics, all this technology has been possible because of the fundamental concepts and, and tools provided by AI. And these uh, robotic and machine vision technologies would allow us to then do something in the farm, which includes understanding the cropping environment, make farming decisions, implement farming decisions, and analyze those farming decisions. What does that mean? It means that we can be more efficient in water and nutrient management, we could be more efficient in pest management, canopy management, harvest and post-harvest operations and such. And in all of this, cyber physical system creates an environment where all the sensors, the equipments, the human being involved in this process can be connected together to make this kind of decisions. And this is already happening to some extent, but it will be playing more and more important role in the future. So along with that, I want to uh, take another minute or two talking about what are the uh, specific opportunities for us uh, working in this agricultural automation and mechanization field. One, continue to exploit systems approach. We want to continue to exploit the capabilities of artificial intelligence, all the technology as mentioned earlier, but going beyond, we'd like to, to work very closely with geneticists and breeding experts 
crop architecture improvement uh, that includes uh, horticultural expertise that I mentioned earlier many times. We'd like to continue to explore the capabilities of computer scientists and roboticists and mechanical engineers as in addition to agricultural engineers and also socioeconomic uh, uh, scientists uh, who can bring that uh, socioeconomic aspects into this, uh, this systems approach. Um, and through this, I, I believe we need to optimize cost and robustness as I, as I mentioned earlier. For that, speed is a key. We are always trying to improve the speed of our machines, but also we are trying to develop machines that are multi-purpose, meaning it is not just a, a robotic system performing harvesting three months of a year and sitting there idle for nine months. Rather, we want to develop a machine where we can plug and play new tools to do harvesting, pruning, thinning, uh, training, and, and maybe even chemical application, maybe even pollination as we go into the future. Uh, this is an example of how orchard system improvement have been helping us. Uh, I don't think I need to spend time on this. Um, we all know about it. Um, we have been dealing a lot about um, data volumes, data types, availability of large amount of data. I think into the future, we need to work more and more on how to convert those data into actionable information so that farming communities would be able to use this data in a meaningful way. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, connectivity and integration, uh, Internet of Things, um, to be more specific, would be um, a tool that we would like to be able to use um, everywhere um, in all our farming operations. Um, uh, that certainly depends on uh, faster connectivity into the farmlands, which I believe is severely lacking right now. Um, I already talked about big data analytics. Uh, I just want to close by uh, 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 presenting this one concept here. Uh, some people disagree uh, with me in this particular one. It has been to some extent a controversial discussion in some settings, but I would like to mention this. I think in the future, farming should be automated as much as possible and farmers, managers, and operators should be operating from a remote office where they can use virtual reality and many other sensing and communication technologies to supervise, operate, manage, and troubleshoot these machines as needed rather than being with the machine right in the field where they're exposed to a very difficult and sometimes toxic environment. For example, I think even now we should be able to operate a, a chemical applicator, a sprayer from remote location, uh, which uh, then allows us to be outside of that environment where chemicals are being applied. I think this should be the future. It's not very new technology. For example, we have um, we have a drone or 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 automated. Uh, flight operators sitting in, in for example, uh, Phoenix uh, flying an airplane over in Afghanistan. These technologies are already there. We just have to bring them into farming as well. I already talked about plant level management. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much.